Uh, we appreciate everybody joining us today. Uh, this is uh, really a terrific turnout considering all the, the activity uh, and uh, turmoil going on around us. While many of us are back in Washington today, we're holding this committee virtually in compliance with the regulations for remote committee proceedings pursuant to House Resolution 965. This authority has allowed us to continue to do our work on behalf of the American people while keeping our staff, families, and the broader community safe. Yes. We've all started to become familiar with navigating this technology. I do want to remind members of a few procedures. First, consistent with the regulations, the committee will keep microphones muted to limit background noise. Members are responsible for unmuting themselves when they seek recognition or when recognized for their five minutes. Members and witnesses must have their cameras on at all time. We've got to keep track of you. Even if you step away from the proceedings, please leave your camera on rather than logging out. Finally, as you know, we may have votes during today's hearing. It looks like they're going to be later, but if we do have votes, it would be my intention not to recess. Members should go vote when their group is up and come back immediately. If your turn for questioning comes up while you've stepped away, I will get back to you. Today, we're holding a hearing on trade, manufacturing, and critical supply chains, lessons from COVID-19. It's a little poignant for us to start our proceedings. Uh, first uh, committee activity that I've been involved with since we lost Mr. Lewis, um, who really uh, set the standard on so many different levels, was the conscience of the committee, uh, was someone who touched us all and showed not just courage and stamina, uh, but humility uh, that is rare in our environment. He was truly a unique human being and will be sorely missed, but he will continue on in our memories with all the great times and experiences that we've shared with him. As John Lewis would have wanted, we must continue the people's work. And I hope all our work will be guided by his principles and his valiant example. Today marks the first virtual hearing of the Trade Subcommittee. The hearing topic is one of the most utmost importance to our ability to emerge from this ongoing COVID-19 pandemic with a stronger, more resilient economy. Re-examining the trade and manufacturing policies that have led to a fragile, I dare say brittle, and opaque global supply chains and amplifying the painful lessons we're learning from COVID-19 to make sure we're better prepared for the inevitable future crises and challenges. The pandemic highlights the impact of globalized supply chains designed to pursue the lowest price, whatever the true cost without appropriately accounting for possible risks, such as unanticipated disruptions to sourcing, relying on complicated and multi-tiered supply networks easily disrupted, and losing key manufacturing flexibility in the United States. I think we fail to fully appreciate these vulnerabilities. The pandemic has revealed the almost total extreme lack of transparency in, into supply chains while exposing the dark underbelly of what were once considered innovative, cost-saving business models. The dependence on limited inventory and just-in-time delivery enhances our vulnerability. And COVID-19 has served as a very painful example of long existing problems. In the spring, I was horrified to see medical facilities across the country, including hospitals and nursing homes in my community, struggle to secure personal protective equipment and life-saving medical devices like ventilators. We witnessed state governments forced to turn to unreliable suppliers, charging exorbitant prices to obtain desperately needed medical products. While I'd hoped that this dark period was behind us, in the past few weeks, we're seeing shortages again emerge as cases spike in various parts of the country. Despite the tool at its disposal, 
such as the Defense Production Act, the administration has been unwilling to use the full power of the federal government to develop American productive capacity to meet the ballooning demand for these critical products. For the richest country in the world, this seems absurd and a sad reality. COVID-19 underscores the decline in American manufacturing, which presents major economic, national security, and public health challenges that can no longer be ignored. We must think strategically about our domestic manufacturing capacity, both in the context of the COVID-19 crisis and what comes next. These considerations must be understood in the ongoing and emerging economic, security, and technological competition with China. China has not been shy about its intent to use industrial policies that deploy, deploy the full might of the Chinese economy in the furtherance of its strategic and geopolitical goals. The United States cannot sit idly by as China invests heavily in those ambitions. As members of Congress, it's incumbent upon us to seek out experts like our witnesses today to identify issues and to learn from past mistakes. Policymakers must think about how the United States can mitigate the risks while cultivating dynamic and innovative manufacturing capacities and economic opportunity for our workers and for our families. As part of the effort to first understand and ultimately address the deficiency in our existing policy, I'm pleased that we were able to convene this panel of experts who can provide a diverse range of views and perspectives as we consider policies that ensure greater resilience in critical supply chains. We must keep an open mind about the policy levels that are appropriate moving forward. I encourage my colleagues on the subcommittee to use today's hearing as an opportunity to actively examine available policy tools for addressing one of the most consequential challenges of our time. In the conversations that have been developing around the topic of re-examining supply chains and the relationship between trade and manufacturing at home, there's been a lot of excitement regarding tax incentives by American policies or applying additional tariffs. Our examination, I would argue, should not fixate on one particular tool to the exclusion of others. Let's keep an open mind, keep our eyes strategically focused on our objectives. Meaningful solutions will require us to work together to be thoughtful, strategic, and creative. They will require our best tools and ideas to work in concert, likely across policy areas. Without prejudging what specific tools may be, I'm confident that trade policy is an important part of the answer. Today's hearing is intended to assist our committee in a robust, productive, and bipartisan effort to harness trade and manufacturing policies to create resilient and versatile supply chains. The future of the American economy, the health of our workforce, and our leadership and innovation is at stake. With that, let me please I turn to Ranking Member Mr. Buchanan for his opening comments. Byrne. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to take a moment to offer my condolences to the family of Congressman John Lewis. John and I work closely together on many issues as members of the Ways and Means Committee, including as Chairman and Ranking Member of Oversight Subcommittee. And particularly, we worked on, closely worked on Taxpayers First, First Act, the first reforms to the IRS in two decades. He was a remarkable man who dedicated his life to making our country better and more inclusive for all Americans. His wisdom and inspiration will be dearly missed in this committee and this Congress, but never forgotten. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this timely hearing. This important issue has been at the forefront of our minds as we have been fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. I hope we can work together to find bipartisan and common sense solutions to making our medical independence, strengthen our supply chains and create a seamless and non-disruptive manner, more manufacturing jobs and invest here in America. I wanna thank our witnesses for taking the time to testify and share your views with the subcommittee. This panel has shown us how important it is for us to be med medically independent and to have a supply chain that are reliable and flexible no matter how they are structured. If we want stronger and more resilient supply chains here, then we must be the best place in the world to do business. I enthusiastically support the Pro-Growth Tax Cuts and Jobs Act 
because it helped to do just that by improving our tax incentives for manufacturers and conduct research and development in the United States, creating more jobs here at home. President Trump has enacted many common sense regulatory reforms over the last several years that have also greatly improved our, improved our competitiveness around the world. As we work together through the health and the economic effect of the pandemic, Republicans understand that action is needed to make us more medically independent and pre prepare for the future crisis. The pandemic has show showcased the urgency for having a vital medical products like PPE and pharmaceutical availability quickly and reliably. We cannot rely on our adversaries like China. This is why the Republicans have put forward the faster cure uh, through innovation agenda, which seeks to create and expand tax incentives to make the United States more medically independent. I'm proud to have introduced the American Innovation Act, which allows startup businesses to expense more of their startup costs and preserve the important tax benefits like R&D credits in the hand of American innovators to develop new cures and treatments so that they can be used with, with exciting new products as they're brought forth to the market. This package is just the beginning. Committee Republicans continue to put forth winning pro-growth propo proposals that will strengthen our manufacturing base and create more investment and in production and jobs here at home. It's vital for America to maintain its status as the premier location in the world for any innovation and manufacturing. That's the goal of the Republican pro-growth agenda. I also introduced the Secure Americans Medicine Cabinet Act to create a new federal office to stop encouraging companies to ramp up manufacturing and create the National Center for Excellence for Advanced Pharmaceutical Manufacturing to develop and manufacture more active pharmaceutical agreement, agreement, in, agreements uh, within the United States. Another key consideration when assessing supply chain resilience is diversity of supply. Our allies play a vital role with us in making us medically independent and establishing dependable soft supply chains that isolate our adversaries like strengthening our global standing and increasing export opportunities for U.S. manufacturers. China poses serious threats for our supply chain and national security. Working with trusted allies maximizes our strength and safeguards our role as a global leader in manufacturing healthcare innovation, and it effectively discourages our partners from adopting localization measures that cut off our vital export markets. Mr. Chairman, this is not a partisan issue. I believe we are we are both committed to ensuring and uh, to secure and dependable supply chains that benefit Americans. Let's work together to address the challenges we face in a seamless, proactive, stable way that ensures our health, security, and economic prosperity. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for calling this important hearing. And I wanna also thank all of our witnesses. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Buchanan. Uh, we appreciate uh, your comments. We appreciate your leadership and partnership. We have a distinguished panel of witnesses here today to discuss the policies to develop robust and resilient supply chains. I would first like to welcome Erica Fuchs, Professor of Engineering and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon. Then we will hear from Prashant Yadav, Senior Fellow at the, Senior Fellow at the Center for Global Development. Following him will be Roxanne Brown, International Vice President at Large of the United Steelworkers. And then Ms. Glass, uh, Kim Glass, President and CEO of the National Council of Textile Organizations. And following Ms. Glass is Tom Duserberg, Senior Fellow at the Hudson Institute. Each of your statements will be made part of the record in its entirety, but I would ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes or less, if you could. Uh, Professor Fuchs, you may begin. Thank you, Chairman Blumenauer, Ranking Member Buchanan, and members of the subcommittee. During the pandemic, I spoke with a medium-sized U.S. medical supplier, which had imported equipment from China capable of manufacturing 9 million masks per month. Surprisingly, their most challenging bottleneck was the ear loops for the masks. 
to work in their automated machines, the elastic needed to be no latex, a precise width and elasticity, and to come in a bag. They found a domestic supplier for a small fraction of the necessary elastic. But on a spool, and for a while, a worker hand unspooled the elastic with the expected productivity slowdown. When discussing critical technologies, we wouldn't think elastic. And yet that lack of elastic cost our country millions of masks a week. <laughs> the lesson from this story, however, is not that we need to produce elastic per se. What's missing is the capability to pivot, diversify the suppliers internationally, adapt the equipment, change the elastic, change the mask to not require elastic, change the regulations. That inability to pivot is the tip of the iceberg for how dilapidated the U.S. manufacturing ecosystem is. First, for the U.S. to compete, we must make innovative products here that are demanded by the world. If we do it right, it can be a win-win for national security, the economy, and jobs. Making advanced products domestically can create good jobs for hardworking high school graduates. I'm not talking about automating everything. While automation, IT, and digitization are clearly important, they are just one set of a range of innovations. Our research shows that many of the advanced manufactured products on today's critical technology lists are likely to create more demand for skilled craftspeople and empower those skilled high school graduates to have more involvement in the innovation process itself. How do we get that technology manufactured in the United States? Unfortunately, my research shows that the globalization of production makes it harder for U.S. innovators to bring their ideas to market. When firms move manufacturing to developing countries, it reduces the cost of old products, making innovative new products have to be that much better to compete. We need to help U.S. innovators leap over this valley of death through mechanisms such as increased and extended SBIR funding. Second. The U.S. needs to rebuild its manufacturing ecosystem through strategic investment in infrastructure. Infrastructure for transit, energy, communications, and data address needs of society and manufacturing. Done right, it can also build national capabilities in the companies and skilled workers who become the manufacturing workforce of the future. To lead in manufacturing the products of the future, we need to build the infrastructure of the future. The Mason, Foreman, engineer, and computer science skills relevant to intelligent transportation and urban infrastructure systems have corollaries in resilient grid infrastructure, privacy-preserving health infrastructure, and intelligent manufacturing. Our investments and training should be strategic to leverage these overlaps and the career transitions between them. Third, as you've heard, manufacturing the right advanced products domestically can increase national security and demand for high, skilled high school graduates. The right investments in infrastructure can serve triple duty in creating the groundwork for manufacturing success. But we must make the right investments, which brings me to my final point. We cannot just produce more products, more, so we cannot just produce more reports with lists of critical technologies. The U.S. needs a nimble entity that combines program managers and analysts to make strategic investments that ensure national technology competitiveness. That entity needs enough money for its investments to be influential, but a sufficient lack of money such that it is required to engage and influence other agencies to have a larger effect. Getting these decisions right is going to require an organization with technical depth run by interdisciplinary teams of our best and brightest. Otherwise, as we are currently with COVID-19, we will be flying blind. Whoa. Thank you, Dr. Fuchs. Uh, Dr. Yadav? Uh, Chairman Blumenauer, Ranking Member Buchanan, and members of the committee, 
My name is Prashant Yadav. I'm a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development and affiliate professor at INSEAD and a lecturer at Harvard Medical School. Over the last two decades, my research has focused on global medical supply chains. Thank you for the opportunity to share my viewpoints as testimony to this committee and for convening this very important hearing. Shortages of PPE, testing supplies, and other medical products have highlighted the grave challenges we face in our medical supply chain. But much of the discussion has focused on PPE, where there is a high geographic concentration of manufacturers in China. The supply chain for different types of medical products, though, varies a lot in its economic geography. For example, the supply chain for test kits is less dependent on manufacturing in China uh, and more dependent on production of key components in Europe. At the very aggregate level for all medical products, Ireland, Germany, Switzerland, China, and Mexico together make up about half of U.S. imports. It's important to remember that the U.S. is also a significant exporter of medical products with a 12% share of the global market. When we start disaggregating this picture by uh, product categories, a, a different picture emerges. China is the top exporter of face masks and active pharmaceutical ingredients, or API. India is a significant exporter of generic medicines. So the organization of medical supply chains is based not just on lower labor costs, but due to the clustering of technical know-how, tax incentives offered by certain governments, and proximity to R&D hubs. For API, for example, environmental legislation in the US and EU was one of the factors that led to moving production to China and India. Next, I'll briefly present some ideas uh, to make our medical supply chain more resilient. First, we should diversify our production bases, but not limited only to domestic manufacturing. It is tempting to think of producing all critical supplies within our national borders, However, if this is implemented hastily, it may further reduce the resilience of our medical supply chain. COVID-19 has shown us the huge risks that geographical concentration of manufacturing brings. We've also experienced some of this at home when Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, where a large part of our saline bag manufacturing was concentrated and it led to shortages in hospitals across the US. Reshoring production of medical products also doesn't happen with the flip of a switch, building new production plants uh, for medical products requires several years sometimes to ensure that the steps required for sterile manufacturing, regulatory approvals, and process efficiency are steadfastly in place. So we do need to create sufficient reactive capacity, capacity which can be scaled up and down quickly within the U.S. to be able to rapidly respond to surges in demand or disruptions in global supply. Through the um, through the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, we can provide capital for U.S.-based medical companies so they can expand and diversify their supplier bases to traditional countries, especially for PPE. In addition to creating supply chain resilience, it will also allow us to contribute to economic development and create goodwill in countries in Africa, Latin America, and some parts of Asia, which are currently not well integrated into global supply chains. Setting up alternative manufacturing sites and keeping spare capacity costs money. If left to their own devices, it is unclear if all companies in the medical supply chain will invest sufficiently in resilience. So we need a mandatory stress test for the medical supply chain. Keeping adequate supplies um, for critical products in the strategic national stockpile is by far the most robust way to ensure we have enough supplies to meet our emergency needs. Purchasing for the stockpile can prioritize those manufacturers who have reactive manufacturing capacity in the U.S. in order to keep their supply lines running. We need a congressionally mandated National Academy of Medicine expert committee to reevaluate the governance and technical design of the SNS. In summary, I would say as we prepare for the massive supply chain that will be necessary to manufacture and distribute potential vaccines for COVID-19, we are reminded of the global nature of the vaccine supply chain in which glass wires, adjuvants, other items come from a supply chain with a vast global footprint. We have a national imperative to ensure the security of our medical supply chain, but we need not frame this issue of supply chain security as a zero sum game. Our national interests are best served by looking at diversification in our medical manufacturing while preserving our trading partnerships and contributing to well-being around the world. Thank you, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Professor. Ms. Brown?
Are you unmuted, Ms. Brown? Thank you, Chairman, very much. Uh, thank you, Chairman Blumenauer, Ranking Member Buchanan, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Roxanne Brown, and I'm honored to serve as International Vice President at Large for the United Steelworkers Union. I appreciate the opportunity to join you, and our union's international president, Tom Conway, sends his regards. The Steelworkers is the largest industrial union in North America, and we represent workers in a, in a vast array of industries and are uniquely positioned to discuss the themes of trade, manufacturing, and critical supply chains. At the heart of my testimony is the need for a pragmatic, strategic, and thoughtful manufacturing plan for the U.S. that puts America's workers at its core. COVID-19 may be the catalyst for today's conversation, but our union has long known that without a strong, globally competitive manufacturing base, our members, our communities, and our country are all less secure, less resilient, and incapable of truly responding to crises when necessary. Union members throughout this country continue to stand on the front lines in the face of this pandemic and provide the necessary supplies to help our frontline workers and communities stay safe during this unprecedented time. For example, USW members at Cure Medical in South Carolina make rubber stoppers for syringes and other components for intravenous drug delivery. The demand for these products doubled as the COVID-19 crisis increased and our members stepped in working safely to produce these small but vital components. At the beginning of the crisis, American Roots in Maine, which traditionally produced clothing items, faced layoffs. The company quickly retooled to produce face masks and face shields using a USW represented paper company in New York as a supplier for the filters. This effort led to American Roots recalling all laid off USW members and the company hiring 75 more employees. These are just two examples of the untold stories of how U.S. workers and the domestic manufacturing industry stepped up in a time of extreme crisis for this country. They represent a small fraction of what an interconnected manufacturing economy can do in the face of crisis. We also have to recognize the value of manufacturing as a bread and butter issue for American workers. Manufacturing workers earn 13% more in hourly compensation than comparable workers in the rest of the private sector. These amount to not just family sustaining wages, but community sustaining wages. With that, I'll touch on a few items Congress should consider as part of a broad plan for U.S. manufacturing. First, spurring innovation. We must uplift the collective R&D, engineering, and manufacturing capabilities that sustained innovation. The American Association for the Advancement of Science highlights the historical trends on federal R&D spending consistently dropping from 1.23% of GDP in 1976 to less than 0.71% today. We need to foster a supplier ecosystem. For example, we need to improve our domestic pharmaceutical supply chain. The U.S. pays the highest prices in the world for its medicines, many of which are derived uh, from NIH-funded research, Yet according to the FDA, only 28% of active pharmaceutical ingredient manufacturing is located in the United States. We need to update our export facilitation program. It will take federal resources to increase export. For example, the International Trade Administration's most recent budget proposed a decrease of $35 million from the previous year. This is the agency that investigates our country's trade enforcement cases. And without adequate resources, manufacturing workers will face continued dumped and subsidized goods. We need to address existing foreign industrial overcapacity in many base commodities. That is why our union continues to support 232 tariff relief in steel and aluminum and strong trade enforcement mechanisms. Until there is a real global cooperation to contain industrial overcapacity, the U.S. should not let other countries export their unemployment. And we need an empowered labor force. This requires an investment in our workforce and an ability to negotiate safer processes and conditions at the work site through collective bargaining. Over the years, we've ceded jobs, manufacturing capacity, technology, and innovation to other nations. We cannot adequately reopen and restart this country 
without the policies needed to support a strong domestic manufacturing base. Our union is ready to work with Congress to craft a manufacturing plan that recognizes the critical role of America's workers and invests in and encourages the ingenuity of domestic manufacturing. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Today. Ms. Glass, we have, I want to make sure everybody's muted if they're not speaking. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, um, thank you so much. I am the President and CEO of the National Council of Textile Organizations. And on behalf of our 600,000 American workers uh, who annually manufacture $80 billion worth of U.S. textile products, I want to thank you for the opportunity today. Before I begin my formal testimony, I want to acknowledge the profound loss of your colleague and friend, Congressman John Lewis. He was a friend to our industry, and we extend our deepest condolences to all of you, his dedicated staff and his family and his constituents. The topic of your hearing today is a vital one to examine, and it's a timely discussion. The PPE crisis is the most illustrative example of how our over-reliance on, on China and the sheer breakdown of our global supply chains. I feel it's important to document the recent historic efforts of our domestic textile industry to alleviate the nation's catastrophic PPE shortage and to acknowledge our heroes on the front lines. U.S. manufacturers are now supplying, textile manufacturers are supplying hundreds of millions of urgently needed items, including face masks and isolation gowns, at a time when global suppliers failed to meet the needs that this crisis required. The industry and its workforce are proud to serve the American people and want to work to help onshore this industry long term. Regrettably, the economic crisis spawned by COVID-19 has forced the cancellation of virtually all normal U.S. textile production outside of some PPE production. In fact, as hard as this might seem, we have companies who can make PPE in our own backyard but simply don't have enough orders. Existing conditions are so severe that century-old textile companies that survived the Great Depression, the onslaught of imports over the past 40 years, and the Great Recession are facing the reality of extinction. If this persists, the goal of making the U.S. self-sufficient in PPE production will be unattainable due to the collapse of key parts of the domestic textile manufacturing. There is no doubt that China is the dominant supplier. We, uh, for our industry, China ran a $42 billion trade surplus for U.S. Textile, textile products in 2019. But the predatory practices have been allowed in China to become the dominant player for PPE, where they possess more than 50 percent of the global production pre-COVID. Since the onset of the pandemic in February, China's production of PPE has increased five times. And over the weekend, many of you saw the New York Times released an investigative video highlighting the production of PPE in Uyghur camps with forced labor. We need a robust manufacturing stimulus package for workers and the industry. We need strong domestic procurement rules to help in incentivize investment in the onshoring of our industry. We released a report with other uh, key industry associations earlier this week outlining a pathway forward on domestic procurement policies. This includes um, procurement policies to expand the Berry Amendment rules for PPE purchases across the federal government, to help instruct federal government agencies to fully exhaust U.S. PPE production capacity. And to, we're also urging the government to award multi-year contracts to U.S. industry to help onshore some of these investments. We've outlined plans to help uh, the, the robust stockpiling efforts with respect to the strategic national stockpile to ensure that we have the goods that we need when we need them and other tax grant and grants and other incentives for our industry. NCTO also believes we need to preserve the integrity of our tariff structure. We need to crack down on predatory trade practices that exacerbate offshoring. We need to eliminate loopholes in our tariff structure that may have unintended consequences, like the Section 321 de minimis waivers that mass distributors are using to exploit for millions of tariff-free entries each, jet, each day that is impacting um, uh, manufacturers here at home, as well as the health and safety of the products going to our consumers. 
We must also block efforts to expand GSP treatment to cover textile and apparel products. There is a reason that these products have not been included in GSP over the many years. This would have a devastating impact on our textile manufacturers and to our trade agreement and trade preference partners, many of who have also stepped up to help in this PPE crisis. In closing, the time is ripe for a revival of American PPE textile manufacturing. It has already begun, but we stand at a crossroads. With the right policy framework, the domestic PPE supply chains built overnight can endure and grow, and we can create a domestic self-sufficiency and diversify our supply chains outside of China. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, next, we have Tom Dusterberg from the Hudson Institute. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman Blumenauer, Ranking Member Buchanan, members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to speak about the crucial issue of the resilience of our supply chains at a time of pandemic, economic crisis, and the growing challenge of Chinese mercantilism. to uh, meet national economic and security needs, especially by cutting off not only the supply of uh, goods, but uh, transportation networks and uh, indeed the supply, the uh, movement of people throughout the world. But these weaknesses were already becoming evident in recent years <clears throat> as China and other competitors eroded America's industrial base. My recommendations um, in, in my testimony are intended to strengthen the overall economic and policy environment for a robust industrial sector that will meet both short and longer term national security, medical security, and advanced technology competitive, competitiveness needs. While I support targeted measures to, uh, for specific security needs, my overall framework seeks to avoid uh, over-reliance on subsidies for individual industries and on pro uh, protective trade measures. We do have reliable allies that complement our own resources and manufacturing capabilities, and we are a major exporting power. We need to avoid uh, uh, contributing to a destructive cycle of competitive subsidies and market opportunities um, and to convince our friends to be more active in supporting our actions to combat Chinese mercantilism and other unfair trade practices. Let me now turn to some of the recommendations I outline in my testimony. In terms of tax policy, I, I support a corporate tax system which uh, keeps uh, uh, corporate uh, income tax rates uh, competitive with the OECD average. I also support increasing the R&D tax credit to promote more reinvestment in tax policy should also incentivize, as uh, several of the other panelists have mentioned, investment in skills training to uh, ensure that we have the workforce required for advanced manufacturing. Some especially vital areas, such as crucial material products in the medical sector or in things like rare earth metals, which are needed to support most high-tech electronics, may require even uh, stepped-up tax incentives. Uh, I also support a sizable increase in federal support for basic scientific research and for enlarging the, our STEM and skilled workforce human capital. Um, one of the other panelists uh, mentioned the decline in uh, U.S. investment in uh, uh, basic research and development, and I support uh, at least a hundred billion dollar uh, a year increase in our investment in these uh, these areas. In terms of trade policy, we should continue to push back against Chinese mercantilism using all the tools at our disposal. We should continue to attract allies uh, to join us, although this is a tough sell with our European friends. I note that a, a competitive uh, race over industrial policies and over-reliance on purely domestic production uh, can uh, erode our ability to, to uh, keep markets open and gain support for efforts to convince China to adhere to the accepted rules of in, 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 um, in, uh, international commerce. We also need to have um, uh, allied support to achieve much-needed reform of the World Trade Organization. 
whose rules fail to cover egregious Chinese practices, uh, such as uh, state subsidization, IPR theft, and failure to uh, adhere to the normal rules of transparency required by the WTO. Other measures, such as um, reducing Chinese access to uh, Western capital markets and prohibiting um, uh, purchase of sensitive technology companies can supplement trade policy. Finally, um, I pay some attention in my testimony to China's increasing control of raw materials needed for advanced manufacturing, such as rare earths, gallium, cobalt, and magnesium, amongst others. The U.S. depends on China for much of these materials. Trade policy and other measures need to address uh, the Chinese exploitation of the Belt and Road Initiative practices in Africa, Central Asia, and South America, and their abuses of international standards on labor and environmental uh, practices in their mines and processing plants that are under their control. Uh, such actions are needed for U.S. firms in the semiconductor, solar power, fiber optic cable, telecom equipment, and electric vehicles in industries. Let me stop there, and I look forward to, to your questions. Very much. Uh, Professor Fuchs, you talked about uh, infrastructure investments. Um, we just recently passed uh, HR2, uh, a, a massive uh, multi-dimensional bill uh, ranging from uh, transportation to uh, the grid, sewer water. Uh, I, I don't want to take time on it right this minute, but I wonder if you would have a moment uh, to, ref uh, to look at what we passed and reflect on, on the extent to which uh, this meets our needs or if there are gaps uh, in this massive bill that, uh, that remain unaddressed. I would welcome thoughts that you might provide to us at some point. Uh, we're not done with that. It's going to go back and forth between the House and the Senate, hopefully. Uh, but I would be very interested in making sure that the infrastructure meets the needs that you care about if you wouldn't mind. I'd be honored to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Brown, you, you talk about uh, having the capacity uh, to uh, be able to develop the workforce. We talk about this all the time, as you know. It is a, uh, a topic of much discussion, uh, but we seem to fall somewhat short. Uh, you've been around the block on this uh, several times. Do you have some thoughts and observations about what we might be able to do differently this time in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of some of the uh, the concerns we have for equity and development. Is there something we can do different? Uh, thank you, Chairman. I very much appreciate that, that question. Um, you know, I would say that overall, and this is something that you're probably going to hear me say a lot today, is we are significantly lacking in this country in a just overall broad industrial policy that includes a lot of what my fellow panelists have actually spoken about today. Um, you know, from the, the steel worker members' perspective, this has been a decades-long struggle. Like I said, I, I've been around the block a lot on this issue, and our union in particular has been before this subcommittee many times before, um, you know, on the issue of, of, of trade and unfair trade. And, you know, for us, there are some really critical pieces that we need to see. Um, I'm getting a little feedback on my end. Hopefully you all are not hearing that feedback as well. Um, but the investments in domestic manufacturing in terms of R&D, the strengthening of our trade laws, uh, in terms of a workforce, making sure that we have the workforce of not just today, but the future. Uh, training is a big piece of what needs to happen within the manufacturing space. When people often think about training, it's always directed to uh, predominantly building trades unions. but there's a huge opportunity as we talk about the role for domestic manufacturing and investments in manufacturing in this country uh, for there to be a, a manufacturing workforce of the future. And so there needs to be a lot more, uh, I think, partnerships at the local level with schools uh, and colleges, um, with, with manufacturers in those communities 
to train up not just uh, you know current manufacturing workers, but go into the high schools. Um, you know, attract young people to want to come into the manufacturing space. I think a lot of young people uh, feel that this is not a sector that's viable anymore uh, because of the devastation that we've seen over the last, you know, four decades or so in manufacturing. So there's there's much that we can do in the way of of, of trying to strengthen domestic manufacturing and just the workforce that that will that will play a role in it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Glass, uh, I was struck by uh, your uh, description of how reliant we are on China. Um, the fact that people are able to make transition to help us move forward, but we still have uh, gaps where there's uh, an inability to take advantage of some of the capacity we have there now. Do you have a sense of what it is that we do so that we end up being stronger when we're done, not more reliant on China and other countries? Um, Mr. Chairman, you raised a good point in your opening remarks about the fragility of the supply chain, and the, this certainly exposed some fragilities within our own uh, manufacturing sector for textile. A lot of the finished products uh, and the making of finished products have gone offshore for a variety of reasons, uh, low labor costs. Uh, a lot of our industry, some of them have made PPE and have been in that business for a long period of time, but a lot of that has gone offshore decades ago because of the uh, of, of um, consumers chasing the lowest price product. Our industry, um, to almost everybody in our industry that I speak to, wants to make major investments to plug those holes and to bring automation and technology needed necessary to making PPE here. But they need some level of certainty. You can't invest in technology and equipment without purchase orders or a sense of what the, that horizon will look like. And what we are asking for the federal government to do is to help us help in ourselves invest in this sector. And that can be done for a variety of reasons. Right now, um, the government is moving forward with trying to purchase products for a strategic national stockpile. It's a significant, it's gonna be significant purchases. Everything from uh, testing kit swabs to isolation gowns, try to give our industry some longer term contracts so that we can realize that investment, we can amortize it over a period of time, and it will help this industry grow. There are certainly certain holes in our um, a domestic textile industry, but that being said, regardless, we literally had companies get calls from governors, from the White House, from state legislatures, asking for PPE and created supply chains overnight. So this is a very versatile industry. Um, they want those calls to happen. They wanna be part of the solution and they recognize that we have a crisis on our hands still months after COVID-19 um, really came into full force in March. And we're here to try to help onshore this industry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Yadav, I, uh, again, for the sake of uh, timing here, I want to move on and let my colleagues have their opportunity uh, to make comments and ask questions. But I would like to follow up with you um, uh, in the future about how we make sure when the next crisis hits, that we aren't facing the same issues of supply chain fragility. How do we learn from this experience? And with your permission, I would like to explore that with you offline. Thank you, Chairman Blumenauer. we will be delighted to. Well, you're very kind, I, I appreciate it. Uh, I wanna move on here. Uh, we have uh, ranking member Buchanan. Uh, you uh, are recognized for your inquiries. Well, again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the critical hearing. Also want to take one more minute to thank our witnesses for being here today. Uh, Dr. Dusterberg, uh, let me ask you, there's a bipartisan concern, I believe, in the Congress that we're too reliant on China and other adversary for key products. It's clear that China is not rely is a reliable trading partner, especially during times of crisis. How do you suggest, in terms of trade policy, we make that work with our allies to pre present a united front against China. What are some of the prime opportunities you see in terms of bilateral, regional, and multilateral approaches? 
Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Buchanan, for that for that question. Uh, we are too reliant on China for in a in a lot of different areas. Um, I highlighted in my testimony raw materials, um, such as rare earths. Um, we are not the only country that is reliant on China for these types of products. The Europeans, uh, the European economy, especially the German economy, is highly dependent on uh, the auto automobile sector. They're also trying to develop higher technology industries like semiconductors, where the United States is dominant. There's an ample opportunity for us to work together to fight back against China, uh, China's control of mining and processing and even production of these materials. Uh, that's just one area. In terms of medical products, I think the pandemic has uh, highlighted the ability to cooperate uh, with our, uh, our, our friends in the UK, especially uh, um, uh, to develop vaccines and uh, other uh, uh, medicines to, to deal with the, um, with, with the pandemic. Hey, doctor, let me, I've got limited time. Let me ask another question. Uh, what is, we definitely need help. Can you hear me? Let me. Uh, I can hear you, hear you now, yes, sorry. Let me, let me move on just quickly because we're just limited on time. Uh, I've got a bill I've introduced, Securing Amer Americans Medic and, uh, Medicine Cabinet Act, uh, about stockpiling drugs. The understanding I understand is that China produces, whether the ingredients or the production or the manufacturing, of 70, 80 percent of our drugs. I'm in Sarasota, Florida. We have one of the most senior communities in the country. Many of these are critical, life-saving drugs. Uh, so I'd like to get your thoughts about how do we uh, minimize that and get back uh, where it makes some sense where we can produce ourselves in America. I know for a lot of years, a lot of things were produced down in, in Puerto Rico, uh, but it seems like it's moved offshore. So I guess the question is, is, is it your understanding as much as 70, 80 percent, a lot of these critical drugs are being produced, manufactured or managed out of China? And then if so, uh, what can we do about it? Well, uh, there's a lot of controversy over the data, but the data I've seen um, uh, indicates that we're not that dependent on China for uh, basic products, nor the, the manufactured uh, final, final drugs. Uh, in fact, we're much more dependent, if you will, on, um, on Ireland or Germany or Switzerland uh, for advanced pharmaceuticals. But nonetheless, we produce about 70% of the pharmaceuticals and medical products that we need. I think tax policy is key to returning production to the United States, as, as your committee and your, your colleagues to legislation uh, to uh, make it more advantageous to produce in the United States. I also think we need to have uh, serious consideration, as one of the other panelists said, of uh, more stockpiling of drugs and doing stress tests so that the next pandemic that comes around will be prepared with the necessary stockpiles. But dependence on China is really not the problem here. We do need to bolster uh, domestic production with a variety of uh, initiatives that your, your committee and your colleagues have. Uh, Oh, thank you, and I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. We recognized for five minutes to question our witnesses. Uh, we will not observe the Gibbons rule in this remote setting and instead go in order of seniority, switching between minority and majority members. We request that you unmute yourselves when you're recognized. Uh, our colleague, uh, Congressman Pasquel is unfortunately unable to join us today, but he sent a statement that he would like to enter into the record, and I hope uh, there's no objection to it being included. Is there any objection? If not, it will. We will have it uh, so inserted. Uh, Congressman Kind. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I too want to thank our witnesses for your testimony here today and. Listen, we are all heartbroken with the loss of our dear friend and colleague, John Lewis, and our thoughts and prayers certainly go out to his family during this difficult time. And 
I too want to express our best wishes to Bill Pascrell and hope that he has a speedy recovery so he will join us uh, shortly. So get well, Bill, if you're tuning in right now. Uh, Professor Fuchs, let me start with you. Uh, in regards to a global pandemic and uh, just in time delivery, most companies, most manufacturers don't want excess inventory sitting on their shelves, sitting in the warehouse. And yet just in time delivery, which is practice, does catch us flat footed from time to time. Are there any answers to that other than just the federal government buying up supply and storing it in some warehouse uh, waiting for the next pandemic to, to break out? Thank you. Um, I would say that just in time delivery as a manufacturing system uh, should not create any problems for our response. If anything, it would enhance our ability to respond. Uh, the key would be to have that capability or any other manufacturing capability, uh, at least in some part domestically uh, in our response. Well, staying with you for a second, uh, is there a way for us to encourage greater coordination between various federal agencies? I'm thinking USTR, NIH, Commerce Department, so we have a better ability to look around the corner and a better anticipation of a global pandemic and what we need to ramp up quickly before it's at our doorstep and before it's really too late because Listen, we're in the seventh month now when this virus hit our shores, and we're still running into PPE shortages. We're still running into testing shortages. That, that is just inexcusable for an industrial power like ours. Do yes. you have any suggestions? Absolutely. I, I, the type of agency that I'm describing uh, that would have the capability to guide strategic technology decision making should be able to address those challenges. Uh, some people talk about events like these as black swans, uh, but they're not, uh, actually to quote one of my colleagues, uh, they have some probability distribution over time. And so what you need is both the analytic capabilities uh, to identify, we don't agree today on what is a critical technology. Uh, you know, is that about being able to reinforce our human values? And nor should we ever have agreement, but we need analysts that can help us identify the trade-offs in those technologies. And we also need program managers who can invest then strategically in what our holes are and our gaps are in the nation and combine with other agencies to do that. Dr. Yadov, can I ask you your thoughts on our ability to look around the corner and be in a better position to coordinate the, uh, the supplies that we need to deal with a crisis like this? Thank you, Congressman Kind. I, I think um, two responses. One is, like you rightly pointed out, I think interagency coordination in both looking at what's likely to come uh, and then getting prepared in terms of supply chain resilience, having the right manufacturing capacity, both domestically, but also with our trading partners, is an area that requires more work. This pandemic has highlighted where we, we, we have um, gaps in agencies coordinating. The second is, um, in, in response to your question on just-in-time uh, inventories, I would say if the purchasers in the market, whether it is the federal government, the state purchasers, or private purchasers, if they are constantly looking for the lowest price medical products, then companies in their quest for efficiency do go towards just-in-time manufacturing and just-in-time inventory but if we engage in the concept of stress testing, where we ask companies to demonstrate how they will meet large surges in demand and disruptions in global supply, that will bring some more emphasis on moving away from a very just-in-time uh, driven philosophy of inventory and, and manufacturing. And secondly, it may also bring about diversification of supply bases. So that could be an area which will help us get to that means. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I see I'm running out of time, but Mrs. Brown, I'd like to follow up with you when I can to explain the anomaly we're seeing in the marketplace right now, where we have demand for scrap steel that's low, and yet prices are increasing. Uh, and that's typically not what happens in supply and demand uh, marketplaces. So I'd love to just follow up at some point and, and get your perspective of why that's occurring. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure, we're happy to do that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Congressman Kind. Uh, Congressman Nunes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses who have joined us today. Global supply chains are complex enough without having to deal with dishonest trade partners and malign global actors. As a member of the Intelligence Committee, I have a unique perspective on this issue and its dire economic and national security implications. I've seen firsthand the predatory practices and unfair barriers American businesses face. If they wish, China could swiftly and easily block medical supply chains critical to our nation's healthcare system. That is one reason why I recently introduced two bills that would help reshore our critical medical supply chains. To secure these supply chains, we must incentivize and unleash American innovation. China's economic abuses affect our medical supply chains as well as every other sector of our economy. For example, an agricultural company in my district recently discovered that one of their products was being counterfeited, built in China, and then sold back to the United States. So I only have one uh, question uh, today, uh, Mr. Chairman. That's for uh, Mr. Uh, Dusterberg. Uh, welcome, Mr. Dusterberg. Thanks for being here. And I would just ask, uh, give you an opportunity maybe, and I know you talked about it in your opening statement, but to talk about maybe some of the corruption that's occurring in, in our supply chain uh, by Chinese companies. So kind of using that example that I gave of a company in my district uh, where they copy something, start making it, then reselling it back in the U.S. I was hoping, thinking maybe you had some more opinions on that and examples possibly. Thank you. Well, the uh, uh, theft of intellectual property, including the design of and production of, uh, of uh, materials has been going on for 20 or 30 years in China. Uh, I remember um, when I was uh, the head of the uh, Manufacturers Alliance, uh, one of the, my members came to me and said, well, a Chinese company just came to me and asked me to um, uh, uh, build these, this product that goes into automobiles. And I said, well, I already built this product for uh, another American company. Um, and it's, this looks like exactly the same design that um, uh, has already been used. So uh, this has been going on for a long time. In terms of uh, medical products, uh, there were uh, good examples early on, especially in the uh, when the pandemic was unfolding, especially in Europe. Uh, the Chinese first cut off supplies of uh, personal protective equipment and other needed products, and then they started uh, trying to flood the market, uh, especially in Europe, and claim to uh, donate uh, supplies. And some of those were so defective that the uh, the Europeans who are more friendly to China than, than we are, just simply uh, sent them back because they were, uh, they were so defective. And we've had examples here as well in the United States of uh, subpar uh, products being exported to us and Chinese taking credit for trying to help out in the pandemic. Yeah, I noticed uh, that even a lot of the tests that uh... People have been sending me for the COVID tests are still coming from the swabs or at least coming from China. So it shows that we have a real vulnerability there. But thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for your time and thank you all the witnesses today. And I yield back. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Congressman Davis. Danny, you're not unmuted. We can't hear you. Danny, we can't hear you. No. Yep, got it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Let me thank you for holding this very important hearing. And I certainly want to thank all of our witnesses for being here. I'm so accustomed to following Bill Pascrell until I wasn't sure it was my time. But Bill, we're missing you and look forward to you coming back. Um, I also need to just acknowledge that we've already begun to experience life a little bit without uh, John Lewis. And John, it will never be the same without you. Ms. Brown, let me ask you, uh, 
Before COVID-19, while the unemployment rate was steadily decreasing in many parts of the country, but in other parts, including areas in my congressional district, you could see unemployment rates as high as 20 to 30 percent. Mainly among those I refer to as hard to reach workers and those that have aged out of traditional vocational training and other programs. I've been working on developing legislation to expand the work opportunity tax credit in construction trades in an effort to capture those individuals, but also to expand work opportunities post COVID-19 in manufacturing. Let me ask if you're familiar with the work opportunity tax credit and how important do you think it is to expand programs like these to meet our COVID-19 needs and to expand the workforce in the future? Thank you so much, Congressman Davis, for that question. Uh, you're absolutely right. You know, before COVID-19, the, the manufacturing sector, particularly in, in districts like yours, uh, was, was already struggling. Right. Um, so the, the pain uh, that we're talking about right now that manufacturing uh, has been experiencing during COVID was really bad. And what this crisis did was exacerbated on the part of a lot of our members and communities across the country. And I'm not uh, very familiar with the work opportunity tax credits, but what I am unfortunately very familiar with is trade adjustment assistance. Uh, and on the manufacturing side, uh, that that's the program that exists to help manufacturing workers who do lose jobs as a result of, of unfair trade, which I know that this subcommittee is very aware of that program. And we would agree with you that it's really important to uh, expand and strengthen these types of programs, uh, especially at a time where manufacturing workers continue to feel the weight of, uh, of unbalanced and bad trade policy. And, and that's something that we would love to talk to uh, to this the full committee, but certainly the subcommittee about more in detail because we definitely have ideas about you know how uh, t programs like like TAA can be strengthened. And uh, ironically, um, you know this week there's a, a Verso mill in Mr. Kine's district um, uh, paper mill in, in Wisconsin, where on Friday tomorrow we're getting ready to file a, a TAA. Um, a, a claim uh, on behalf of our 900 workers who are losing their jobs at that mill. So again, to your point, Mr. Davis, you have 900 workers at this mill, a lot of them who are older. And I think anyone who knows where paper mills are, they're in some of the most rural parts of this country where, you know, oftentimes it's the paper mill, the post office, uh, you know, and, and the school. So there are no real viable um, options when you lose a uh, $85,000 a year paper mill job that includes, you know, benefits like retirement. So um, I, I I completely agree with the sentiment of your question, um, and and absolutely look forward to talking about more how we expand programs like these. Thank you very much, and uh, Ms. Glass, if I could quickly ask for your perspective as to why we just can't seem to have the, 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 the kind of supplies that are needed uh, for the COVID right now. What's been happening? Um, Congressman, that is the quintessential question. I, I think for our industry would say that we have not fully maximized domestic production that's in our backyard today uh, that could be retooled in, in real time to help with the PPE crisis. There's a disconnect between those who are seeking PPE and those who can make PPE. We need to better link the industry up with the needs of our local communities and our federal government. Um, it, it's a shame to me to read headlines in a newspaper that everyone needs PPE right now and recognize that our industry has capacity to help. We have some of the best manufacturers in the world uh, who uh, are developing research and technology to ensure antimicrobial fabrics are being made 
that ensures infections do not translate in the hospital setting. We need to be doing a lot more here, and it's, it's a complicated question, Congressman, um, but I appreciate it because it's certainly the, the, the forefront of this hearing today. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Rice. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, my focus in Congress has been on trying to make our country competitive uh, in tax policy and trade policy and regulatory policy infrastructure and so forth, because I always felt like uh, it, it, if we just got the government out of the way and put our American workers on a competitive playing field, that uh, that uh, they could compete with anyone. And so many times from the other side of the aisle, I've heard, well, those jobs aren't coming back. But uh, Mrs. Fuchs, I, I think I hear you, or Dr. Fuchs, I think I hear you saying that we can get some of those jobs back. Is that right? Absolutely, and for a matter of fact, by investing in critical technologies that involve innovations in advanced materials and processes, uh, we can have greater demand for middle skills uh, for hardworking high school graduates. Ms. Dr. Fuchs, do you think that competitive tax policy matters? I mean, if a company can pay half as much in Ireland as in the United States or half as much taxes in China, do you think that factors into their decision-making on where they locate? Absolutely. I, I think we need to put everything on the table, right? So we have tax policy, we have uh, SBIR programs. So alone, one, if we don't align these various uh, incentives, it's not going to be enough. We need to align demand and uh, reduction in costs, as well as uh, the appropriate funding mechanisms. And Dr. Fuchs, in your work, have you seen any uptick in import of manufacturing jobs as a result of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act? Interesting. I have not studied that directly. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Yadov, uh, I am a disciple. Are you there, Dr. Yadov? Yeah, I see you. Uh, I'm a disciple of your uh, compatriot at Harvard, Michael Porter, who's an expert in competitive theory. And uh, a lot of the ideas that I put forth, I have gotten from uh, uh, reading his materials and meeting with him. You mentioned that uh, China, Mexico, and India are a lot of our imports. I think you were talking about medical supply chains. Is that correct? Yes, quite right. And you said that the reason is because uh, of tax incentives that these other companies offer in their proximity to global supply hubs. Is that what you said? Proximity to R&D hubs. So what I was referring to Congressman Rice was the production of certain pharmaceuticals, which is carried out in Ireland, Switzerland, Germany, and they are the top exporting countries to the United States is driven by a combination of tax incentives, but also the fact that technology, know-how, and proximity to where R&D occurs, those factors are converging. What, what about, what, Dr. Yadav, what about our protection of intellectual property here? It seems that the pharmaceutical companies and others really uh, like our intellectual property protection that we offer here in this country, is that correct? Yes, I think the United States is, um, yes, the United States is uh, a great example of trying to balance intellectual property, access, and affordability what, for medicines. What, what if we condition some of that protection on production in the United States? Do you think that would be a good incentive for people to bring production back here? Congressman, I, I haven't studied this in detail. I presume it would, but I'm happy to explore this and send a written response. Uh, uh, Mrs. Brown, uh, you were talking, you're with the steel workers, but you're talking about paper mills, and I have four paper mills in my district, and I have a couple of uh, steel plants as well. Uh, one thing we saw, you know, as a result of the regulatory reform that we've gotten done for COVID, as a result of the trade reform that we've gotten done for COVID, as a result of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, with the unemployment rates at below 4% nationwide, uh, one problem that we were running into is that even with that, even with opportunity that hadn't been seen in decades in this country, we were struggling to get people 
off the sidelines and coming to the manufacturing jobs. My tech schools were telling me they could place a thousand people in manufacturing jobs if they could find the students. How do you engage a lot of these poorer communities? How do you engage people uh, to to take advantage of these opportunities that that you know? How do you get them out of generational poverty? Thank you so much for the question, uh, uh, Mr. Rice. I really appreciate it. And, I, and I'll just say that, yes, while uh, manufacturing pre-COVID uh, was in an improved place, it still definitely was not anywhere where we need it to be as a, as a country. Um, let, let me ask you this to follow up on that question. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that if our country's regulatory tax trade policies were sufficient, just put American workers on a level playing field, do you believe that the American steel workers and the American paper workers can compete with anybody? Absolutely. I think if tax policy is fair and puts actually American workers first and not American industry first, then certainly uh, we would see some some benefits for sure. And regulatory policy, when when crafted correctly, can actually lead to competitiveness. So I, I completely okay. agree. Okay. Um, to, yeah. To, oh, sorry. Uh, I was going to say to your earlier question, Mr. Rice, in terms of uh, attracting. Uh, oh, Mr. Chairman, are you? We need, wanting me we, to... need to, we need to move on. The time's okay. expired. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you, Mr. Right. Chairman. Thank, thank you very much. Congressman Kildee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to all the witnesses. And I want to start off by echoing some of the comments that uh, my colleagues and some of the witnesses have made about our friend uh, John Lewis. Um, you know, the country will never be the same because he lived and what we do every day will never be the same because it's gone. And I think one of the ways we honor this incredible giant uh, is not just by commemorating his life, but actually trying to continue the work that his life was dedicated to. And so I'm going to try to do that every single day. And I'm going to try to do a little bit of it right now. At a hearing, uh, in April of 2015, Congressman Lewis said, and I quote, what does it profit a nation such as the United States of America to gain a trade agreement and lose her soul, to lose her soul by leaving so many people in America and around the world behind when it comes to human rights, labor rights, the right to organize, collectively bargain, protect the environment, unquote. So I think we need to think about all of this in a, in a very broad context. So I'd like to take uh, a lead off of what John said uh, a little over five years ago and ask a question that relates to this question of human rights. Uh, I think we have to enact fair trade policies and deal with these issues uh, to contribute to uh, opportunity for everybody, but not engage in a race to the bottom hurts American workers by embracing trade relationships uh, with nations that exploit their workers. My district's become uh, a bit of a victim to this phenomenon. A company in my district, Hemlock Semiconductor, makes polysilicon, polysilicon or solar cells. Uh, these panels uh, used to be made right here in the U.S. by our workers. For a long time, the U.S. didn't really care where the solar panels came from as long as they were cheap. Now our American manufacturing has been decimated and we're heavily dependent on foreign countries, especially China, for solar panels. Today, more than 40% of the world's global polysilicon used in solar panels are made in Xinjiang province in China. A place that is notorious for its human rights abuses. Instead of employing thousands of people in my home state, we, by extension, support those abuses by supporting that market. So I, I could, if I could start with um, Ms. Glass and then perhaps have Ms. Fuchs also comment, can you talk about some of these examples how our trade policy actually supports some of these human rights abuses and the race to the bottom for America? Um, Congressman, uh, you know, th thank you for that question. Um, our industry has been closely obvious. Our industry is the largest employer globally of workers. 
by far none. And often in develop in developing world countries, a lot of women are employed in our sector, uh, making apparel and other textile products. Human rights abuses in our industry has been something that's been happening globally for decades. And um, it's no secret, even though it's getting a lot more attention in the media, the, media the, the atrocities happening with the Uyghur population um, are, are, are atrocious. Um, and we, even in this COVID-19 pandemic, believe it or not, prior to COVID, there were four manufacturing facilities that were in these essentially concentration camps. Uh, and now post COVID, there are 51. And the New York Times did an eight minute video segment. I would encourage you all to watch it um, about the PPE production happening. This was happening not just on PPE, but not just on your solar panels, but also on yarn, on apparel, on other items. And, and this has been going on for a very, very long period of time. I know Congress has looked at this and started to act with respect to this. Uh, it is important that we look at every enforcement tool uh, in, in, with respect to cracking down on human rights in the spirit of Congressman John Lewis and all of your commitment on human rights issues moving forward. These are some of the predatory trade practices, not just China, but in other areas of the world. But this is an illustrative example of, of that overall abuse. Thank you. I think I'm just tired if, uh, if during the course of the hearing, others want to make comment, I would certainly that or follow up later on. Thank you. Earl, you're muted. Well, that's, I'm, we can hear you. I think now you're muted. <laughs> I keep hitting. there. You are okay. We can hear you now. Well, lucky you, <laughs> Dave. You want to take it away? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I, I know we have all started with saying something um, kind about our departed colleague. Um, had an interesting situation a couple of days ago. I have this amazing photo. Um, with him and my little girl when she was there in the committee with us. And um, uh, it, it's one of her, you know, it's it's one of her Hall of Fame over in her little room. So I'm, I'm hoping there's situations like that where we can keep his memory alive and service to the country. And even with someone like my four-year-old for the next generation. So, um, and to our panel, um, I actually want to get a little bit more granule, and let's see if we can do this. It, it, some of the conversation has been wonderful, but I think it's been very um, textile and PPE. I want to understand if, if you have a complex worldwide supply chain with a China concentration today, if ways and means, if we produced tax policies and incentive policies and regulatory policies, that drew certain types of manufacturing. I'm, uh, before a number of people were sounding like um, Taleb, if anyone gets the joke, uh, and using the words fragility and robustness. But I've always been concerned because we've had discussions of so many products, so many pharmaceuticals, there may be one simple ingredient or one simple component that exists one place in the world. So even if you make your supply chains more robust, do we have a competent way to actually look at everything within that production line so you don't have one thing out there that's sitting in a dodgy place that gets held up for extortion? Um, and we see this particularly with even the discussions of bringing certain pharmaceuticals back, where there turns out there's one small precursor that exists in one location that actually stops the entire manufacturing process. Um, so my first question to my professors and my smart panel, do we have the ability to audit and understand all those components 
And as we're talking about making ourselves robust, is it bringing all that to North America now that you know we have USMCA, or is it making sure that there's never that one fragility, that one product in one country, but that at least those things are in multiple places? Um, so whoever would like to step up and you know assuage me of am I fixating on something that's either too complex or not important enough? Um, uh... Thank you, Member Schweikert, for this fantastic question. Um, uh, three brief answers, uh, which would be one, tax policy with where we are today, I believe is important, but not enough. Uh, and that's why I was proposing the in strategic infrastructure investments. Uh, the second is that uh, we do not have the capacity uh, even within the Department of Defense, uh, it, this is an enormous problem and not a trivially solved problem uh, to, to map all of our supply chains. But also, when I co-chaired uh, the National Academies Committee on U.S. Science and Innovation Leadership for the 21st Century, uh, in their opening remarks, both DARPA and the Department of Defense uh, Strategic Protect Protection Agency uh, spoke that they did not have the capacity they wished they would have in terms of understanding our competitive position in different technologies and where to move there around internationally. And that's why I'm proposing that we need to develop uh, that strategic decision-making capability, uh, which we don't have today, uh, including around areas that are not just uh, defense, but also areas where our values around human rights or around uh, privacy, uh, to uphold those, we may need to have technology leadership. Um, does anyone else have something to share on the concept of an individual component or individual ingredient having a, a rare concentration? Um, because, you know, even if we got a lot of the policy right, you still could hit that level of extortion in certain products. Um, Congressman Schwecker, this is uh, this is an area which I think is an important one to examine. For example, adjuvants that go into manufacturing vaccines, one particular type comes from the bark of a specific tree, and it will take us many years to synthetically start manufacturing that adjuvant without the need for that so-far tree, which at this point is native only to uh, Chile or a couple of countries in Latin America. So there are numerous examples like this, where as we look at which component, we, we, we will have to, to do systematically need, an analysis of that. We need to wrap this up. Uh, we have uh, Congressman Panetta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. And uh, ranking member, I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, this is the uh, first hearing I've been a part of on the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, where since the passing of Congressman John Lewis. And uh, obviously as a fellow congressman and as a fellow member on the Ways and Means Committee, I gotta say, I've never, I never got used to being the colleague of John Lewis. Just something I never got used to. However, I hope that we can honor his memory by working hard and working together to try to live up to his legacy and ensure economic and social equality in this country, not just during this pandemic, but clearly thereafter. Now, as we've seen and as we're discussing today, this pandemic has tested our supply chains, which have proven to be less resilient than we thought when, unfortunately, with devastating consequences. And these concerns go far beyond our economic panic about toilet paper and disinfectant wipes. But as we've seen, Supply chain weaknesses do hinder our ability to fight this virus, especially, especially with the lack of supplies and for testing and for PPE. So what it comes down to, and is clearly stated, clearly stated by our expert witnesses, if we are to make it through this pandemic and to be prepared for the next one, we must repair our supply chains. And that does mean making greater investments at home and building up our domestic capacity and of course ensuring a diverse supply chain capacity. Now, one of the areas I think this has become evident is in testing. And I have always said that the lack of testing, be it quantity and be it quality, is the original sin of this pandemic. I think we know without a vaccine, the way we're able to get through this is by testing more and testing better. 
uh, especially with the asymptomatic nature of it. Uh, unfortunately, we've been blind. And when I visited a testing site last week in my district on the central coast of California, uh, they said we're able to give out tests. So we have the quantity, but the quality was not good in the sense that they were getting the results back in literally seven to 10 days, unfortunately. And to me and to many people, that just doesn't work. And I think there's a reason why we read an op-ed by one of our prominent governors, Larry Hogan, who had to go outside the normal supply chains to secure tests from South Korea when this first started. And I do believe that stems from a lack of unified, coordinated strategy when it comes to testing. Now, ideally, I would have liked to have seen, and I have called for in legislation, the DPA invoked by this administration to ensure proper production of testing kits, testing supplies, testing swabs, you name it, in order to get more, better, quicker, more advanced type of types of testing, including uh, point on contact type of testing where they can get the results instantly. And so Professor Fuchs, I wanna uh, basically address my first question to you. Do you believe it's important to have a national strategy for supply chains when it comes to testing for COVID-19? Uh, I believe we do need coordination uh, of the type that you've described. And for a matter of fact, I think uh, the coordination both to uh, expand testing, but also to push forward innovations if they are able to uh, improve the false negative rates, for example. Uh, so instead of one in every three tests being a false negative, if that were down to much less, we would have to do a lot less testing. And, and Ms. Fuchs, and if you can speak to this, do you think the use of the Defense Production Act could have helped that? There's many ways the Defense Production Act uh, can be used, uh, but I do believe that this is a national problem. I can't think of any thing more obviously a uh, network externality and a, na a national problem to solve. Great, thank you. Ms. Glass, in regards to PPE, would the use of Defense Production, Production, Defense Production Act, excuse me, would that be the production of PPE? Yeah, uh, from from our vantage point, yes, because the Defense Production Act a lot would allow for contracting authority with guaranteed purchase for a period of time. And even getting to your point on testing kit swabs, we have a U.S. company. Prior to the pandemic, there were only two testing kit swab producers in the world. One is in Copen, Italy, and the other was Puritan in Maine, which has the Defense Production Act. We have a member company, and we were in touch with Dr. Peter Navarro very early on who makes swabs and literally are, are making testing kit swabs today. So now we have three big producers and the company's name is U.S. Cotton in Cleveland, Ohio. So we need to think about what long-term purchase orders mean in order to help that production chain. Great, thank you. Thanks to the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Super. Uh, Congresswoman Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I join my colleagues in expressing sorrow for the loss of our colleague, um, John Lewis. And my prayers are with his family and his staff and, and our nation as we mourn him. Um, thank you to all of the witnesses for joining us today. Um, I think the hearing today is a, was a great idea and exactly the role our subcommittee should play when trying to better understand um, what is a complicated and dynamic subject in the, in the middle of, the, of a pandemic. And I appreciated this opportunity to kind of take a breath and hear from experts and um, uh, give us an opportunity to um, process the information you've provided and maybe be able to respond with thoughtful policy. Um, so thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership here. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed some serious vulnerabilities in our ability to produce, procure, or scale capacity um, in response to supply or demand shocks, as we have discussed um, in, with the various questioning before um, my my turn. And I think it really raises questions about um, what we should do to make sure we always have access to critical supplies to save lives and protect our national security. However, I am concerned that some people who are already skeptical of global trade are using this crisis to advance long-held protectionist goals. And I think it's important that while we address the 
the issue at hand, we don't um, overcorrect in response to this pandemic and assume that all answers lead to tax cuts for businesses to increase domestic capacity. Um, or, and I think having exclusive domestic sourcing is both unrealistic and counterproductive. It would just leave us as vulnerable to shocks here at home as to ones abroad. And so, Dr. Yadav, your testimony rings true to me, and I share a lot of your views. I agree that the goal should be diversification, not domestication of supply chains, not complete domestication of supply chains. Um, so, yeah, so in some instances, diversification will include increasing domestic capacity, what you call reactive capacity. But it should not be the only solution to build our resilience. Can you explain how diversification could have ameliorated some of the specific problems that have emerged during COVID-19? And if possible, what, what does a diverse supply chain look like if it's implemented? Thank you, Congressman Murphy, and thanks for, for that question. Uh, I agree fully that only domestic production will not help us build supply chain resilience. When we say diverse and geographically diverse sourcing basis, what we imply is if our PPE supplies, instead of coming largely from China, Let's imagine they came from a number of manufacturing sites in the U.S., but in addition from manufacturers that were in Latin America, in Southeast Asia, in countries in East Africa, perhaps. Uh, that would have helped us be more resilient and not have so much dependence on one particular region. So that's what we imply when we say diversified supply bases. So it sounds to me like the antidote to this um, uh, crisis isn't uh, necessarily a re retreating from global trade, but it's actually more global trade, just a smarter, more diversified global trade. My next question for you is that, you know, you, you had this idea about stress testing the medical supply chain, um, like how we stress tested the banking sector in the wake of the financial crisis. Can you explain a little bit more about how this might work in your view and what the results might be if we conducted a test right now? So, if we conducted a, a test right now, I think the result would be um, there is very little ability to absorb a shock, either on the demand side or on the supply side. What we imply by a stress test would be asking all companies who have a license to sell their medical products in the United States, demonstrate to a federal agency uh, under Health and Human Services every quarter or some period of time like that, that not only their manufacturing capacity, but their suppliers and their suppliers' suppliers can cope with a certain threshold of increase in demand and a certain kind of supply disruption, including trade and export restrictions by certain countries. And if they can demonstrate that, then we would have resilience. The key thing to keep in mind would be that if we, uh, we should not make this too onerous, uh, otherwise smaller companies would find it difficult to participate in the medical market. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, Terry Sewell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Uh, like my colleagues, I too want to acknowledge the passing of our dear friend, John Lewis and colleague. Uh, he may have represented Georgia for 33 years, but he will always be the boy from Troy and an Alabama native son. We share that in common. I was always uh, greeted with a smile when he would call me the girl from Selma, Alabama, and it was my highlight and my honor to help co-host those pilgrimages from Selma to Montgomery. And I am just in awe that we no longer have John with us, but I do know that John's words, his actions, his deeds fill a lifetime, and he gives us a roadmap if we're only willing to follow it. My question actually is to Ms. Kim Glass. You know, uh, we owe it to John to fight for human rights and equality in all of its forms, especially in our areas in the Ways and Means Committee, whether it's trade policy, tax policy, healthcare policy, or in our everyday lives. I know that if John were still with us, he would have been deeply troubled by the reports coming out of China, which found that forced labor is being used to make PPE and that these products are being are, are making their way into the U.S. supply chain. According to the reports by The New York Times, only four companies produce PPE 
uh, in the Providence before the outbreak. Now there are 51 producers, uh, and at least 17 of those companies are using forced labor. My question is, what efforts can we can we take to ensure that PPE produced by forced labor stays out of the United States and global supply chains? Uh, should we be focusing uh, and strengthening tax enforcement? trade enforcement, sorry, and trade procurement. Also, what can we do uh, to strengthen our Southern Hemisphere supply chains? That has been a particular interest of mine. Ms. Black. Uh, Congressman, uh, Congresswoman, thank you so much for all your leadership. You've been uh, such a strong supporter for our industry and the, re the Western Hemisphere region. Um, to the question, th this came up a little bit earlier related to um, the Uyghur Uyghur population in, um, and the atrocities happening with PP production. It's not just PP production, it's, it's beyond that. Um, but it's astronomical to think about that in this period of time, uh, the companies that are making PPE in that portion of the country um, under the most horrific human rights standards um, is allowed to happen. And in terms of trade enforcement moving ahead, we need on-site verification for those companies uh, on the ground. We need a level of transparency that the Chinese government simply isn't giving to our country or our other countries to help crack down on this particular supply chain. There is a buyer of these products being made by these, by in the most horrific labor conditions that we can we can make. Who's buying these products? Let's hold them accountable. And for the question that you had related to diversifying our supply chains in the Western Hemisphere, we couldn't agree more. We have a strong um, uh, relationship with our Western Hemisphere partners. You know the importance of CBTPA renewal. But just in general, 70% of U.S. textiles go to our Western Hemisphere for uh, export that come back as finished product. How do we ensure that our trading partners get the benefits of the trade agreements to ensure Sure that they're also making PPE and that there's more nearshoring of these products as well as self-sufficiency here at home. Very good. Well, we're trying to push in our bill uh, the helping the Western Hemisphere and making sure that our trade um, partners uh, are given the same benefits and also um, we should make sure that they're not receiving these kinds of uh, supplies made by forced labor. Um, my next question is for Erica Fuchs uh, or for Roxanne Brown. I strongly agree with uh, your testimony that emphasizes the need to strengthen workforce development here at home. The pandemic has highlighted how dependent we are on global supply chains for medical supplies during emergencies and why reducing that dependency by producing more critical healthcare supplies here at home is so important. My question is, can we collaborate on the importance of workforce development and supply chain um, uh, reform conversations, like how can we uh, elaborate on the importance of that and want to know uh, from you, uh, Erica, if you could talk a little bit about um, the importance of workforce development and supply chain reform in that conversation, how we can elaborate on it. I have uh, always been a strong auto manufacturing base in my district and really want to make sure that we are uh, doing all that we can to, uh, to uplift that workforce. Yes. Yes, and automobiles are often assembled regionally for the regional market, and so that's a particularly good one. Um, I actually would like to wrap in uh, Member Murphy's comments as well in, in your in my response to you. Uh, in particular, uh, I don't uh, believe that we should be manufacturing all aspects of the domestic supply chain in the United States. Um, having studied, however, additive manufacturing and uh, the future of uh, beyond CMOS semiconductors, as as well as the automotive industry, photonics and electronics from communications and computing, there are definitely certain capabilities that we need here in order to be able to innovate and continue to lead in critical technologies. Uh, so I, I want to make sure I emphasize that. On the workforce front, uh, I would like to emphasize that I believe um, we can have, well, not just believe, our research shows that the types of uh, activities in advanced materials and processes can lead to better jobs for skilled high school graduates. Uh, and that, that's we need, we need and, and to investment. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, Congresswoman Del Benny. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thanks to all of our witnesses for joining us. Um, I share with my colleagues just uh, the, the incredible loss that we have had 
um, in losing our colleague, John Lewis. Um, it's been heartbreaking, and yet um, he will continue to inspire me, and I know inspire all of us to do better. Um, and, um, and it has been an honor to have served with him. Um, I also wanna give a shout out to Congressman Pascrell and tell him to get well soon, so he'll be back with us soon. Um, I wanted to follow up, I think it, um, I think Dr. Yadav, you had talked about kind of when we look at supply chains, the importance of, of clusters, bringing um, groups of things together has been critically important for, uh, to make sure that products are manufactured, that resources are nearby. You talked about um, innovation happening near where manufacturing might be happening. I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit more on that. We talk about you know, components and we just need to find all the components and put them together and then we get a product and how we might um, bring that, um, bring more of that back to the United States. But um, really, there's a long-term approach that's taken place in terms of bringing um, appropriate suppliers together. And so I wonder if you talk about the strategy we would need to take to do that. Thank you, Congresswoman Delvini. Uh, the key point here is that when a company chooses its location for manufacturing, it typically likes to be in a place which is close to their key purchaser. So if it's a component supplier, it wants to locate, in many instances, close to a finished product producer or a group of component suppliers who want to co-locate or locate uh, in close geographical proximity. And what that does is, in, especially in the medical supply chain, given that some of the medical devices and medical products require um, hundreds, if not thousands of components, clusters emerge where manufacturers of each of the subcomponents assemblies are in the cluster. So if we are serious about US manufacturing and having a, a greater manufacturing base for some medical products, we will have to think about how to create incentives, not just for finished product production or one component supplier, but create some infrastructure that attracts the entire cluster. And that goes similar to Professor Fuchs' comment that some kind of infrastructure may enable us to uh, create such clusters domestically. Thank you. Um, Professor Fuchs, do you wanna elaborate on that a little bit more as well in terms of what we're going to have to um, do to bring all of those um, those components together and maybe some of the long-term thinking that it's gonna require. Yeah, I, I believe that what is particularly important or interesting about infrastructure investments beyond the agglomeration economies mentioned by, or in addition to the agglomeration uh, economies uh, mentioned by my colleague, is that we haven't really thought of infrastructure, which is currently dilapidated, uh, in the United States uh, as an opportunity to build the capability to build. And so if we wanna build the products of the future here, uh, then uh, we need to build the infrastructure of the future and, and the complementarities across that, uh, I think uh, we should be leveraging strategically. Um, thank you. And then um, last, um, Dr. Dusterberg, you, you were actually mentioned um, how important it is that we talk about very basic raw materials, and you talked about rare earths and minerals. Um, currently, the United States is very dependent on China, and you talked about one belt, ro one road in terms of international investments that have been made um, to kind of secure that supply chain. Um, what can we do from a U.S. standpoint in trade policy and in other ways to address these areas that would be critical for us to have um, resiliency in our supply chains? Well, we do need to incentivize uh, domestic production and uh, plenty of ideas on the table. The, the Department of Defense is supporting um, the uh, processing plants and the um, purchasing of, of final products for um, rare earths. I, I'd like to focus a little bit on, on, on uh, another uh, component that I mentioned, which is for electric batteries. I mean, this is uh, lithium ion batteries are the key to mobile phones, to computers, uh, electric vehicles, and to uh, Boeing 787 aircraft. Um, China has acquired mines in the Congo, uh, which are uh, exhibit appalling uh, environmental and labor uh, conditions. I mean, it's literally uh, uh, picks and shovels and uh, 
burlap bags uh, uh, type of mining in, in many instances. Um, the World Trade Organization, I believe, allows us to, or allows anyone to prohibit the import of products that are based on um, exploitative labor or um, um, poor environmental um, practices. We need to call out the Chinese. We need to get together with our allies to um, try to uh, uh, call out their, their abusive practices um, and also to um, their financing, the, the Chinese financing through the Belt and Road is often oftentimes exploitative and opaque, and China needs to uh, join the, the uh, procurement code of the World Trade Organization, as they have claimed they will do. So we should uh, work with our allies to try to get them to um, uh, adhere to international rules. Um, and I think it's very important um, for many, many parts of the U.S. manufacturing sector to, to call out the Chinese on these uh, practices. Thank you. Uh, my time's expired. I appreciate um, your testimony, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. Congressman Beyer. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. You know, we all knew that John Lewis was dying. Um, he, we hadn't seen him in six months. Um, we got regular updates on his health, but we had plenty of time to pre-grieve. Uh, still, um, something changed. I mean, there's a, you can sense this vacuum now. It's quiet, humble, not a showboat, despite the fact that he was more famous and more accomplished than any of us. I just want to say that I miss him and I want to be like him. And uh, a trade subcommittee hearing doesn't seem authentic without Billy Pascrell. So I look forward to having Congressman Pascrell back. Um, Ms. Brown, you, you talked about the, the importance of unions in training workers in the manufacturing sector. I'm, I continue to be struck by the mismatch that we get so concerned about the offshoring of jobs, yet the last time I was over at the National Association of Manufacturing, they said that there's because they can't find the right workers, and that the average salary is $77,000. What can we be doing to overcome this mismatch? Thanks so much. 600,000 so jobs that are, that are good paying, especially, and what, what, what's the role of unions in that? Thanks very much for the question. I think this harkens back to uh, what I mentioned earlier about uh, training. You know, obviously across the country, there are a lot of industrial communities that have been hollowed out and devastated by job loss, right? And when those jobs go, a lot of the, the skilled workers that worked at those facilities, you know, welding and, and performing other jobs, they, they have to leave to try to find other jobs, right? And so uh, I think part of it is, you know, where are these facilities located? And is there already a, a, a group of workers who can perform the, the, the tasks and the jobs that are needed to fill those jobs? I think that's, that's one piece of it. The second piece of it is this training. Um, you know, a, a lot of the technologies uh, around manufacturing are changing. And so we need to make sure that we are skilling up manufacturing workers across this country. Unions do play a role. Um, you know, our union uh, is a manufacturing union. We don't do a, you know, a hiring hall like building trades unions do where they, where they train their workers. But we do do on-the-job training at our steel mills and, uh, you know, at our, at our refineries and our paper mills but we need to go outside of that. So this is where I talked about partnering with local colleges, partnering with high schools, you know, tapping into those schools and colleges that are actually doing these programs and expand upon them. Uh, talk, communicate better about what manufacturing jobs are. A lot of, uh, you know, people across this country don't feel like it's a viable uh, option anymore because they have out. So th those are some of the types of things that we can do. Okay, thank you very much. And Ms. Glass, you talked about um, using the FTAs as a way to secure market-oriented demographic re reforms. I mean, in fact, it showed up in a number of, of your testimonies as if we could raise the environmental and the labor standards in countries around the world, it would make us far more competitive. Um, 
which brings me back to my great concern about us pulling out of TPP, which is going to lift environmental and labor standards in um, 11 countries and allow us to set the rules for international trade rather than letting China do it, which we spent most of the last two hours complaining about. Um, do you think that there's a, a reason, a, a rationale for recommitting to multilateral trade agreements around the world? Uh, Congressman, this is a very sensitive issue uh, for our particular sector. Often during trade agreement negotiations, uh, our sector is the sector that's traded away for market access for other products. So oftentimes when we go into a negotiating session, we're in a defensive posture. And we worked very, very hard on trying to um, cultivate the rules of TPP for our sector that would do no harm or do less harm. But even at the end of the day, even according to the Congressional Research Research service, our industry would have lost some jobs. Um, but that being said, I think tariffs, the overarching view is tariffs play a very important tool for market access to the U.S. economy. It is very important for our free trade agreement countries who do have market access for textile and apparel and other products that we live up to the commitments of that agreement. Um, I, I'm not naive enough to think that our market access is is a is a prize because of so many consumers and our purchasing power. So we need to be smart about the partnerships that we create, the kind of trade agreements with a non-market economy, and how to ensure that China doesn't gain backdoor access to those agreements. We're going to have to wrap it up here. Uh, okay, great. Thank you. Mr. No, no, thank you. Uh, we have uh, gone through all our committee members. We have some uh, guests, uh, other Ways and Means members, not on the subcommittee, and uh, we will recognize them. Uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Weinstrup, doctor. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you all for being here today. You know, I, I want to echo something that uh, my colleague, Mr. Panetta, said uh, that uh, for me, someone who really never planned on, on running for office, to be able to sit uh, in Congress and especially on a committee with John Lewis is just an amazing experience. And I think you, I think you said it real well, uh, Jimmy. I appreciate that. And uh, always a gentleman. And uh, again, what an honor. But thank you, thank you, Chairman. Thank all the witnesses. Uh, when I look at the issue of, of supply chains, uh, I look at it through the view uh, very often in the, in the lens of, of our national security. And certainly this pandemic has clearly underscored the fragility of our, our supply chains, revealed that we're too reliant on, on strategic competitors for key products. That's become very clear. And, you know, I Somehow I got muted again. Am I back? I'm back. Yeah. Sorry, I, I won't try to take up too much more time, but I, I, I hope you heard what I said about, about Mr. Lewis, but I'm saying we can't wait until the next crisis to solve these vulnerabilities that we have. And to me, the conversation has to begin with strategic data-driven assessment of where our supply chain vulnerabilities are and barriers and bottlenecks for producing the key products, identifying our critical needs. And you know, for me, I, it was easy to look through the lens as a doctor in the Army as to what we have, what we rely on, and then start to take a look at the active pharmaceutical ingredients, for example, who owns the products, the, the companies where we're getting our supplies, and, and start to really focus on where we are vulnerable and then go ahead with so many of the great ideas that we were talking about here today, but actually targeting. In the, in the NDAA, I offered two amendments to do that, requiring the Secretary of Defense in consultation with agencies like FDA to report on the barriers uh, to producing the critical medical supplies in the U.S. and identify potential allied partners with whom we can work to realign our manufacturing capabilities. And I think that's what everybody's pretty much agreeing to today that we, we have to look at that. But I do want to start with the, with the, with the data-driven effort that we want to make. And obviously, redundancy in our supply chain is, is necessary as well. Um, you know, we talk about tax incentives, partnerships, 
reducing tax burdens. I think all those things are on the table. Um, but I, I also think that um, we do have to identify exactly what we're talking about as best we can. And you know, with that in mind, uh, I'll ask uh, Dr. Uh, Usterberg, you know, I've been shocked to find out how little data we actually collect on things like active pharmaceutical ingredients and, uh, and the components that make up a drug, for example. And last fall, the director of the FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research testified before the Energy and Commerce Committee that there are a number of limitations to FDA's data, including the fact that manufacturers of these active pharmaceutical ingredients are not required to report whether they're producing API at a given facility or the volume of API produced. And I just want your thoughts uh, to discuss these limitations further, talk about what data we truly need to understand this problem. Well, Congressman, I think you've put your finger on the on the issues that I don't have a, a lot more to add, but we, we do need to get on this. We, we uh, there are what thousands of uh, manufacturing facilities around the world uh, on which we depend. Uh, it's probably been a little bit exaggerated about how much we depend on China, but uh, FDA simply doesn't have the resources to actively um, investigate every single uh, facility. And I believe it's your amendment that would um, give a little bit of flexibility for and identify um, some critical manufacturing facilities that we can de uh, 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 depend on uh, in, in the United States, but in allied countries as well. I think that's one step, but we also need to ramp up, as you indicate, the um, uh, um, analytic capability um, and insist on uh, the quality controls. And, and it's just going to take um, more resources in, in the uh, investigative analytic side of FDA, I think. Well, thank you. I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on it, but I think, I think getting that data is just going to be key uh, to uh, targeting where we need to go uh, most rapidly, I guess. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you. Congressman Schneider. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. And uh, I wanna specifically thank you for allowing me to wave on to the subcommittee today and, and thank all the witnesses for their testimony. Um, like all before me, I am uh, heartbroken at the passing of John Lewis. I, I'm so sad he died, but I am so grateful that he lived. And the example he sets is something that uh, is not just something I hold personally, but uh, share with my kids and, and everybody. Uh, I also want to wish Bill Pasquale a full and fast recovery. Uh, as um, the witnesses have noted, COVID-19 has shown a harsh light on many of the underlying and persistent issues in our country from systematic racial and ethnic disparities to tenuous, the tenuous position of Americans living paycheck to paycheck. But one of the unexpected problems, at least to most, has been the fragility of our, our critical supply chains. Uh, this issue is evident early. In fact, I raised concerns over our supply chains in hearings with Secretaries Azar and Mnuchin back in February and March, respectively. Sadly, by the middle of July, we still haven't solved this issue. Testing capacity remains below where it needs to be. Hospitals in many states are over capacity in their ECUs. They're understaffed and anxious about still looming shortages of personal protective equipment or PPE. Six months into this pandemic, it is truly unconscionable that we are still facing shortages of the masks, gloves, and gowns we need to safely treat, protect, uh, treat patients, protect our workers and the residents in our nursing homes, confidently open our schools and get our economy ultimately on the road to recovery. All the economic stimulus in the world will do nothing unless we are able to effectively control the spread of the virus, which is why it's so important we shore up our supply chains now and make them resilient and redundant. It would be easy to then say, let's make it all ourselves, but the picture, as our witnesses have discussed today, is far more complicated than that. And uh, it's important, I think, we ex explore that uh, closely. I wanna start with uh, Dr. Fuchs, and I was, I was, I, as I was listening to your testimony, I was reminded of the saying, for the want of a nail, the kingdom was lost. But one of your recommendations is we must make innovative products here in the United States that can only be made here, or at least they can be made here best, and that are demanded um, by the world. And I understand that because that is the value added 
what I like to say just in general is we need to invent it here, make it here and ship it around the world. But my specific question is how does that apply to the commodity products like the PPE we're talking about, the, the gloves, the gowns, the masks that are not technically sophisticated, but are, are, are absolutely necessary to safely open our economy or take care of our patients? It's a great question, and I actually think I can respond to Congressman Wenstrup and your question in somewhat of a single uh, unit in that regard. Um, there, I would argue that there is the capability to pivot into new areas and that that lies in our workforce. So one of the problems in the company that we were uh, talking with in masks is that they didn't have the workforce capability to adapt that machine to take other forms of latex, or to, we didn't have anyone signaling to create a new mask that just suctioned to the face with um, certain adhesives rather than having elastic. Right? So some of that is signaling where we need to bring in innovation. And so when I think of Congressman Winstrup's um, uh, question, we're using um, uh, web scraping right now to scrape ThomasNet to uh, understand what our capacity is in uh, medical equipment supplies. Uh, there are opportunities to use top world-class analytic capabilities like machine learning uh, and other capabilities to understand our supply chains. Because right now in a crisis like this, we don't, we can't use the annual survey of manufacturers, which is skewed towards the largest manufacturers. And our ThomasNet data suggests actually we can increase we, the capacity um, of small and medium-sized manufacturers here is, is quite significant. So we don't even know what's happening domestically, no less. And, and, and I'm Sorry, I don't, I don't mean to cut you off. I just I only have a minute left, and you touched on a key point I want to make because uh, we don't know what's happening domestically. And, and uh, Dr. Yadav talks about the need to uh, diversify, uh, deconcentrate, uh, but also manage our um, our strategic supply. Uh, this is why I've been calling for a uh, supply chain czar because I think we need that oversight to be able to do it, and that's critical. I also want to touch on a, a piece of legislation I introduced called the COVID Prepare Act because it's about being prepared. Prepared. You, you hope for the best, but you always have to plan for the worst. And the COVID Prepare Act uh, would require every federal agency within the administration to report to Congress within 30 days their plan for how they're going to deal with the expected spike in cases and, and demand on supplies, resources, people, et cetera, come the fall. Uh, I introduced this as bipartisan legislation. And I hope, I'm hoping it's something my colleagues uh, can support. Uh, I, I'm out of time, so I, I have so many questions. I have so many no notes. I need a bigger desk. But thank you again for letting me be a part of this conversation. It is critical we get our supply chains resolved, just not just for this crisis, but for future challenges we face ahead. And with that, I yield back. Well, thank you. And, and we deeply appreciate your joining us, uh, Brad, and adding to the conversation. Um, Congressman Gomez. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for allowing me to wave on as well. Greatly appreciate your uh, being inclusive. Um, before I start on the... Um, on my questions, I just want to make a point of clarification on some comments that were made. Um, I was, uh, something seemed wrong, so I looked it up. Um, the top source of U.S. imports by volume, the actual medicines themselves, where they come from, are India, Mexico, and China. Only if we measure medicine imports by value are Ireland, Germany, and Switzerland top sources. So by that measure, um, but that measure, on quote unquote value uh, reflects transfer pricing and tax gimmicks, not where the actual medicine is being shipped from. So I just wanna make point out that, that clarification. Um, one of the things that I've um, working on the USMCA working group um, is really kind of learning the lessons of the, of the past, right? Um, we, it took only 20 something years to learn the lessons and change uh, of NAFTA and try to address those. Um, one of the things I want to do is really ask some of our, our, our speakers um, and our witnesses, what are the right lessons um, to learn from the COVID-19 supply chain problems? And, and what happens if we don't learn those lessons? Um, Ms. Brown, um, let's start off with you first. Uh, it's actually really simple. I think uh, the right lesson to learn is just how absolutely critical it is to have a strong domestic supply chain 
in the United States. I mean, at its, at its core, that is the lesson, right? Uh, this is a conversation that for decades has only existed in spaces like this. Um, that are very, you know, focused on trade and trade policy. And the COVID-19 crisis just ripped the Band-Aid off of the failures of, of trade policy, manufacturing policy, industrial policy in this country. Uh, and so now the average American knows, man, we don't make masks here. China is the number one producer of masks in the world. Uh, we don't make uh, enough ventilators here. Um, you know, we had folks scrambling for gowns that some of our uh, members producers were trying to uh, produce, you know, you know, quickly. So that is the very basic lesson that is here. And there is a very serious opportunity that we have um, to, to do good on this. And I, I really hope that this conversation um, leads to some good. Ms. Uh, folks. Thank you, Congressman Gomez. Uh, I would argue that uh, the dilapidation of the U.S. domestic manufacturing capability is what we've learned and, and that we need to respond to that. So not to be here again, uh, we, we need to invest in having domestic manufacturing capability. When, you when I work with companies and they look at global manufacturing sites and where they should locate, uh, they'll often move to a site that previously had workers at another facility uh, because those workers are ready and up to go. Uh, and so in, in whatever country we happen to be looking at at the time. So we need uh, to, I, I think there, it's less exactly what we make, but I mean, except for critical technologies. Uh, but when we think beyond this, we need to have those workers who can pivot. Uh, Ms. Glass. I'll just reiterate the comments um, already made here about our industrial base. We can't have a conversation about the PPE crisis without having a China conversation. Prior to COVID, 50% um, of these supplies were coming from China. They've increased their production five times. They are going to be not only cement, uh, they are definitely going to cement uh, post-COVID their strategic um, priority to ensuring that they are the global supplier moving forward on PPE. Without comprehensive solutions, tax, grants, procurement, and trade, showing a signal to U.S. industry, it's time for you to invest. And, and to get industry that has not invested to come to the United States. Those signals need to be sent now. It can't be during uh, a year from now, two years from now. These policies need to be moved concurrently to help ensure that we have these supply chains here. Yeah. And one of the things that I um, want to mention is that, oh, is that something that I've always noticed is that people always go back to their, uh, the, I guess, the policy that they're used to, right? Um, some people tax cut, some people workforce. Um, and I appreciate your point that it's, it's a comprehensive approach that, that does make it, um, brings back the manufacturing to, to this country. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm concerned about is that um, the role that immigration plays in our, our supply chain and our domestic production of these goods. And this administration's um, attack on immigrants, even highly skilled immigrants from other countries. Um, does anybody want to add anything? Jimmy, to that? I can't. Did I go over time? Your Jeremy? time has expired. Well, I appreciate the um, your uh, time. I couldn't see the, the, the timer. So thank you so right, much. No, I hear you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Um, we uh, had an opportunity this afternoon to uh, uh, understand the use of trade manufacturing policies to build more resilient supply chains. I really express uh, the committee's appreciation to uh, the witnesses for their testimony, their engagement, and the opportunity to perhaps follow up with you. Uh, please be advised that members have two weeks to submit written questions to be answered later in writing, if, if you would be willing. These questions and your answers will be made part of the formal hearing record. With that, uh, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.